Hello, my name is Bear Shea. I am the Restraint and Seclusion Specialist and Coordinator within the Office of the School of Student Supports at the Maine Department of Education. This training is an overview of the Chapter 33 Restraint and Seclusion Rule and is meant to be a basic introduction to the rule and its impact on practice in school, as well as to meet the requirements for the annual notification of rule and local policy. This training isn't designed to be used as a legal reference. It's not part of a crisis response training or approved program. It's really designed so that people will have a foundational knowledge of the basic principles of how restraint and seclusion is practiced in schools and the overall key aspects from the Chapter 33 rule. The goals for this training are pretty simple. We're just looking to develop a basic understanding of Chapter 33 rule and how it applies. Um, we're looking at some of the impacts of restraint and seclusion, and as well as being able to identify the different types, um, lawful restraint and seclusion versus unlawful restraint and seclusion, looking at how we're reporting when there is the result of a restraint or seclusion, as well as identifying some possible alternatives um, to restraint and seclusion so that we can look at reducing restraint and seclusion overall. So when we're talking about Chapter 33 rule, it's probably a good place to just start with what is Chapter 33? What's a rule? How does it pertain to our practice in um, everyday school? And so what we want to do is go back to our main laws, and those come from statute, and that our statute is cited for education under 20-A, and we use a way to cite statute, and you'll see this throughout this training, 20-A, uh, MRSA, and then you'll see the double S mark for state statute, and then the specific statute that we cite for restraint and seclusion is 4014. So stemming from the statute, we start to look at what a chapter rule is, and those are there to regulate the actual statutes themselves and the laws. And they really expand upon and provide outline for compliance to how the statute and law is laid out. Chapter 33 is specifically about standards and procedures for the use of physical restraint and seclusion in schools. And when we when you see the sightings in this training, you're going to see a 05-071, which is our education rules, and then our chapter number, which is 33. And then you'll see any sub subsections, headings and sections listed out um, so that you can refer directly to the chaptered rule when you're trying to get more information. So that being said, why is chapter 33 important? What is the point of having a statute and then a, an even more expansive rule built around restraint and seclusion? And what we know is, is that restraint and seclusion, the use of it in school with children and students, really carries some inherent risks. Um, and that when we're using restraint and seclusion, we want to make sure that we are doing it in the correct way because there is the risk of physical harm, emotional harm, and really can have the most serious consequences, including death. Restraint and seclusion also can have lasting emotional harm to students. Um, and when we talk about students that have experienced trauma or violence, we wanna be even more sensitive to making sure that it's being used correctly. There is no evidence that the use of restraint and seclusion has been a successful tool as behavior modification or um, it is effective in any way of reducing problem behaviors. In fact, a lot of the research has shown that restraint and seclusion can actually lead to an increase in problem behaviors. And so we want to make sure that when restraint and seclusion happens in school, it only happens underneath the outlines of the Chapter 33 rule. And that's one of the specifics that Chapter 33 outlines that we'll talk a lot about today is that restraint and seclusion is limited to an emergency intervention because of these uh, risks and possible negative impacts. So a way to think about when we're thinking about the possible impacts of restraint or seclusion is to use the airbag as an analogy. 
oftentimes it comes in that up while we're traveling in our car or get into you know, a car accident the some of the physical risks, risks right that and it's there to using restraining seclusion there can be risks keep to us safe the from the worst about, things that can happen um, right you know sprains and bruises us but from even broken significant bones. harm and one of the but reasons the airbag why itself we talk can about also do harm seclusion, right when our bodies impact the airbag we're still and it hurt. really specifies it's that just it's not as an emergency response intense, because it's not unfortunately as restraint and seclusion high of a level of in hurt. the United States have as resulted if the airbag in wasn't death. there. And, and so, so when we're thinking about using these restraint and impulsions, are we really want to make sure that it is only in an emergency because and we know just knowing that, that risk of any, harm at any time um, restraint or seclusion is being it used, to, that be harm can happen even just by attempting this to do possible it. risk. And that over time, why we're restraint and seclusion can lead to a, a physiological response uh, within bodies that can actually increase dysregulated and negative behavior. And so those physical impacts are things that we want to consider, and it's why it's only limited to emergency response. However, the impacts aren't only physical. There are also psychological and emotional impacts uh, that can be risks. We know that uh, the use of restraint and seclusion has the possibility to traumatize or re-traumatize students and staff, and that uh, the, the use of restraint and seclusion as an external control mechanism um, can reduce cognitive skill development, um, and that the way that brains develop um, can actually be impacted, and that there can be this sort of um, toxic us versus them. So this person is doing this to me. Um, those people, you know, are doing this to me. And that depersonalization um, for both staff and student can can really have a negative impact on the relational uh, support uh, for students in that educational space. So a way to think about the impacts of restraint and seclusion is to use the airbag as an analogy. In that while we're traveling in our car, if we get into a car accident, the airbag deploys and it's there to keep us safe from the worst things that can happen, right? It's there to protect us from significant harm. But the airbag itself can also do harm, right? When our bodies impact the airbag, we're still being hurt. It's just not as intense, it's not as high of a level of hurt as if the airbag wasn't there. And so when we're thinking about using restraint and seclusion, we really wanna make sure that it is only in an emergency because we know that this risk of harm, um, it needs to be outweighed by this possible risk of why we're intervening with restraint and seclusion. So now that we understand a little bit more about where the statute comes from, how it is set up to govern practice and to regulate how we use restraint and seclusion in schools, and why the statute and rule limit the use of restraint and seclusion specifically to an emergency situation, now we're going to go into the specifics about how use of restraint um, and then seclusion are used in schools. So we're going to go over the definitions, we're going to look at what is permitted, uh, what is, what isn't, and then how we monitor and report those pieces. So when we're talking about restraint, we want to be really specific about what the definition is. And because there are three different kinds of restraint, we want to be very specific. And so the first two kinds of restraint are ones that we would not use in a school environment. And so we're going to quickly go through those just so that we're aware of them. The first is chemical restraint, and this is really using um, medicines or chemicals to uh, limit a person's freedom of movement, which means that we're using the medication chemicals to control them. And so that is not allowed. Another is mechanical restraint, and this is the use of a device to restrict a person's freedom of movement. And probably the first thing that comes to mind is, well, what about seatbelts on the bus? And we do have specific um, language that says that seatbelts, adaptive devices, and medically prescribed devices are not included. 
within this definition of medical restraint, mechanical restraint. So then we come to the third definition, and this is the only type of restraint that is considered under chapter 33, and it's only considered again as an emergency intervention. And so we are looking at the definition of physical restraint, and under the statute definition, this is a personal restriction that immobilizes or reduces the ability of a student to move the arms, legs, or head freely, and, phys and includes physically moving a student who has not been moved voluntarily. So we're really talking about restricting the movement of arms and legs, um, the restricting and controlling of somebody's body. And that's what we're talking about when we're looking at physical restraint in schools. So again, when we think about physical restraint, we want to be sure that we're really specific about that definition. And we have those specifics listed in the chapter 33 rule so that we can be aware of what the specific definitions are. We know that mechanical and chemical restraints are not included in the definition of physical restraint. They're their own kind of restraints. A physical prompt is something that's not included. So this is uh, involving voluntary physical contact. So maybe it's gently grasping a student's hand to help them draw or move something. But again, it's part of that voluntary contact. It means that the student is going along with it and that it, this is really necessary for the development of that competency. Physical escort is something that's not included in the definition of, of physical restraint. However, the definition of physical escort only falls under the specific definition that is used within the chapter of rule, and that's the temporary, voluntary, touching or holding of the hand, wrist, arm, shoulder, or back to induce a student to walk to a safe location. So physical escort under this definition is part of a voluntary engagement. It is you know, putting a hand on a student's back to sort of get them to move to a different space. It isn't grasping onto them and pulling them when they're not voluntarily moving. That would then fall under a different category. So physical escort falls into temporary voluntary touching or holding of the hand to induce a student to walk to a safe location. That's the definition of physical, physical escort that we use under the chapter 33 rule. Protective physical interventions. This is something we're gonna talk about a little bit more specifically later, but these are specific interventions that are used to block, to deflect, redirect a student's action, um, or if a student has an inappropriate grip, like a bite or um, a hair grab. We'll talk about that more later on as well, but those are not included under the definition of physical restraint. And then of course, physical contact when the person, when the purpose is to comfort a student and that the student is voluntarily accepting that, right? So showing that uh, care and affection for students is such an important part of that relational approach that we understand when they, um, you know, when they're struggling and, and they're seeking comfort, that's part of the role. Um, and that that isn't included under physical restraint when it is voluntarily accepted by the student. So now we want to look at when physical restraint is permitted. We know that it's only as an emergency intervention, as we've said, and we will continue to say, but it's also only when the student's behavior poses an imminent danger of serious physical injury to the student or another person. We're gonna talk about this definition a little bit more of what serious physical injury is, and that we're talking about using restraint when there's an emergency and when that student's behavior is posing an imminent danger. So it is right now of serious physical injury. Of, of injury and damage that we are concerned about either to that student or to somebody else. That is when we're talking about the use of physical restraint being permitted. And that's only after other interventions have failed or have been deemed inappropriate and ultimately with the use, the least amount of force necessary. Physical restraint can be used to move a student only if the movement outweighs the risks. And it must be implemented by staff certified in a state approved training program. So staff can be trained in an approved training program to be able to use restraint and seclusion. Um, however, if 
if you are involved in a situation where you believe that there's an imminent danger of serious physical injury to a student or another person, and so you engage in a restraint, um, if an, and you're not uh, trained in that program, then we want to make sure that a trained staff person intervenes and takes over that restraint, takes uh, and brings that training to the situation. And that if that restraint continues, trained personnel have to be summoned to the scene um, to be able to take over. So physical restraint, it needs to be implemented by staff certified. And if it's not, then certified staff need to be available as quickly as possible to take over. The biggest part is that restraints end immediately when that danger of that imminent danger of serious physical injury uh, to a student or somebody else is gone. So restraints are about eliminating that imminent danger of serious physical injury. Um, we're using those as an emergency to intervene. Um, the rule, the chapter 33 rule tells us that we're going to end that restraint immediately uh, when that danger of serious physical injury is gone. So let's take a little deeper dive into some of the important definitions. Um, you know, when we're talking about making the decision to use restraint within an emergency situation, we want to understand imminent danger. We want to understand what serious physical injury means. And then we want to take a look at some of those protective, protective physical interventions uh, that we talked about before that aren't part of um, restraint. So imminent danger. It, it means that that cause um, of physical harm is likely to occur, such as a reasonable and prudent person would take steps to protect a student. So really this is about relying on our judgment in the situation to determine whether or not um, that danger is likely to occur um, and in such a way that we would want to intervene. So that's imminent danger. So there has to be imminent danger. However, in order to uh, intervene using restraint, there also needs to be the danger of serious physical injury. So while we might have imminent danger of physical harm, it needs to rise to the level of serious physical injury. And a serious physical injury by definition in chapter 33 is an impairment of the physical condition of a person um, that is beyond the care of routine first aid. So when we think about scrapes and cuts and um, you know even sprains and things like that, that we when we take our first aid training, um, we know what we can use first aid to apply to. Um, if it requires be more than that, if it's beyond that routine care and first aid, uh, and that we would want to seek out a medical practitioner um, to make sure that they're you know, that the harm wouldn't be more significant, that's when we're talking about the risk of serious physical injury. So beyond just sort of the basic routine first aid pieces. So if we feel that there is both imminent danger and that that imminent danger of harm rises to the level of serious physical injury, that's when we, um, we can use restraint to intervene. In an emergency situation, after we've tried to eliminate, uh, after we've tried all the other interventions um, and, and that we want to make sure that that imminent danger and serious physical injury are both present. Now, the protective physical interventions are, again, they, these do not count as restraints. This would be, these are techniques that are used. So if um, that they're used to deflect, to block. So if a student um, is you know, swinging their arms or, or moving things in a way um, where we need to you know, redirect their body or um, push aside you know, punches and kicks and we're deflecting or blocking those actions either from somebody else or you know, uh, away from harming somebody else, those aren't considered restraints. These aren't grasping and grabbing, right? These are blocks, deflections, these are redirections. They're not limiting the movement of the student. 
um, they're just you know redirecting um, things that could be harmful. The other part of protective physical interventions are using specific skills to disengage um, from a student's inappropriate grip. So in a situation where there is a bite or a hair pull, there are certain uh, training that you can get on how to successfully disengage that bite or that hair pull um, that might require using um, some grisp, some grabbing or some uh, gripping techniques. However, the reason that protective physical invention interventions are not considered restraint is because the student can freely move away from them. So even in the situation where we're using um, a, a type of a grasp to, to get a hair release or a bite release, if the student can move freely away and let goes of the hair and let goes of the bite, then, then it, the student can get away. So there isn't something that's limiting their motion. Um, it's really about how we're using these physical interventions to protect the student and to protect other people where uh, those possible causes of harm are being directed. So we're looking at when we are using restraint for there to be imminent danger, for that danger to rise to the level of, for the possibility of serious physical injury, and that otherwise we're using protective physical interventions in order to redirect block or to um, help a student when we're trying to get them to release from an inappropriate grip. So we've looked at the, the situations where restraint is uh, approved to be used when it's an emergency situation and the imminent danger of serious physical injury um, has arisen. The other part we wanna look at is when physical restraint is unlawful for use. And this is indicated to us through the statute and then reinforced through the chapter 33 rule. Um, and some of those situations um, are, are ones that probably arise you know, as, as obvious, but we wanna make sure that we go through them um, just to be really clear on when physical restraint is unlawful. So we should not be using any kind of physical restraint or escort when there's um, the restriction of blood flow, when there's possible life-threatening risk, and prone restraints when um, a restraint is done for somebody that is face down. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're not using any kind of restraint that relies on pain for control and then any aversive procedures. So um, mechanical or chemical restraints, we've already mentioned that those are not lawful. And aversive procedures would be you know, using something, again, that relies on pain or discomfort or um, a harsh smell or um, something that has that negative impact on the body. We also wanna make sure that restraint is not being used as a punishment um, to control for challenging behavior. We know, in fact, that um, using restraint for this uh, for a, uh, as a punishment can make things worse. Um, we know that restraint is not a therapeutic or an educational intervention, and it should not be used as such. We also know that um, using restraint just for convenience to be able to um, you know move a child from one space or another, or to be able to control a child, um, it is also unlawful, and that using restraint just to prevent the property destruction or disruption in the classroom without the risk um, of uh, without that risk of physical injury um, is also unlawful and then finally we want to make sure that we're not using restraint if it's contraindicated when it's been documented by a healthcare directive um, or within the behavior intervention plan or iep so if that team has um, has put forward that restraint shouldn't be used for a specific student, we want to make sure that, that we're not following, um, that we are following um, that directive and not using restraint. So chapter 33 also outlines how we monitor when restraints are being used and that if a restraint is being used, we want to have at least two adults present and um, at all times, 
and except for safety reasons um, if waiting for that second adult um, is outweighed by the immediate risk um, of serious injury for that student. We want to make sure again that untrained staff, if they've intervened, that uh, we have trained staff that resume control and take over um, in that situation as soon as possible, and that the monitoring needs to make sure that student airways are unimpeded, and if there's any injury, that that injury um, is being reported through the local policy. And we want to ensure that staff are also emotionally regulated. We know that this that using restraint can have a negative impact on students. It can also have a dysregulating impact on staff. We want to make sure that staff are remaining re regulated so that they are using those restraints in an appropriate way. The monitoring should be continuous all the way through until that restraint is terminated. So we know that monitoring follows until the end of the restraint. And so we want to take a look at how chapter 33 outlines um, ending the restraint. We talked already about how the restraint must end immediately once the student is no longer in imminent danger of serious physical injury to themselves or others. Um, and we know that if a restraint is going to continue for more than 10 minutes, we want to make sure that an administrator is coming and um, determining whether or not it should be required for that restraint to continue and that that monitor should be happening every 10 minutes. Um, the time has to be recorded with the requirements of Chapter 33, and we'll talk later in this training about how that documentation happens. And that if attempts to end the restraint haven't been successful, Staff can always require, uh, request assistance from outside sources, from family, from caregivers, from case managers, crisis intervention teams, and use those resources as needed. So now that we've gone through some of the basics for the use of restraint, in schools we're going to cover the use of seclusion. So similarly, we're going to go through some of the definitions that are associated with the use of seclusion. We're going to talk about permitted and unlawful uses, use of seclusion in schools. We're going to talk about locations of seclusion um, and, and then monitoring as well, similar to how we've done with restraint. So seclusion uh, might feel a little bit different. Uh, you know, when we talk about restraint, we often have uh, sort of an idea of what that looks like. And seclusion sometimes might feel a little more confusing. So we're gonna go through some of the basic definitions. Um, the definitions right out of the statute for seclusion um, is it's the involuntary confinement of a student alone in a room or a clearly defined area from which the student doesn't feel free to leave or is physically denied exit. So there's like a number of pieces within this definition that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at voluntary. Um, we're going to be looking at um, that idea of a student being alone in a room or a space um, and that they don't feel free to leave or that they are being denied exit. So those are some of the parts around seclusion. Seclusion doesn't include the use of a timeout. Um, and I think a lot of us as educators have different definitions of what timeout means. And so when we're talking about the use of seclusion in schools, we want to make sure that we're using the definition of timeout that is defined in the rule. And that's an intervention where a student requests or complies with a request for a break. So this is a student who is asking to take a break and to take some space that might be alone or a you know, the adult is saying, hey, maybe this is a good time for you to take a break and to take some a little bit of space on your own. And the student is complying with that voluntarily. So that is the definition for timeout. So we'll talk about when seclusion is permitted, similar to when we were talking about when restraint is permitted. So we want to look at seclusion, well, again, only being used as an emergency intervention. And again, similar to restraint, when the student is presenting an imminent danger of serious physical injury to the student or another person. Again, it's, it's permitted only after those less restrictive interventions have failed. Um, and that, again, seclusion needs to be implemented by staff that are trained in the use of seclusion. And that 
if a staff person who is not trained engages in the use of seclusion, we want to make sure that those trained staff are being summoned and that they're taking control as soon as possible. And similar to restraint, the seclusion will end immediately when the danger of imminent when the imminent danger of serious physical injury uh, has been ended. So similar to restraint, we want to make sure that seclusion is only being used under these circumstances. So again, similar to how we took a look at restraint, we really want to focus on those definitions that outline um, the important terms associated with the use of seclusion. Those are imminent danger, serious physical injury, and voluntary. So we've already looked at imminent danger. Again, just for review, because it is so important, it's really when there is the imminent risk and that injury is likely to occur, right? Such as a reasonable person would actually get in there to protect a student, right? So that's the imminent danger piece. And then that imminent danger needs to rise to the level of serious physical injury, which is a physical impairment that is beyond that care of routine first aid, right? So we're, we're concerned that there's imminent danger, something is going to happen right now, and the result of that happening could be harm that is going to rise above that normal sort of routine first aid, right? So those are those two important definitions um, that allow for the use of seclusion. Another definition to consider is the term voluntary. And voluntary, as defined in chapter 33, means that a student is cooperating with a request that's independent of staff using physical force for the purpose of overcoming a student's resistance. So this means that the student is choosing to go with a request, they're volunteering to cooperate and that staff aren't using physical force to overcome that student's resistance, right? So if we're using force, then that's not voluntary. So when we're talking about using seclusion and that whether it is voluntary or involuntary is going to decide on whether it's seclusion or not. So now that we've gone through some of the ways that seclusion can be used in schools, we want to make sure that we cover the unlawful uses, similar to how we talked about the unlawful uses of restraint. And these unlawful definitions are covered in statute, so we want to make sure that we go through them. Um, seclusion can never take place in a locked room. We know that you know locking a room with a student inside has all sorts of inherent risks. We know that it goes against fire code and, and a number of other uh, safety measures. So we want to make sure that seclusion is not being held in a locked room. We want to make sure that seclusion isn't being used to prevent property destruction, disruption um, without that risk of injury and, um, and, and that immediate danger of serious, risk of serious injury. Um, so we want to make sure that it's not just being used to prevent property destruction or disruption. We know that similarly to restraint, seclusion isn't shouldn't be used as a therapeutic or educational intervention. We know that that is not a um, successful way for seclusion to be used. And in fact, it can actually cause an increase in those negative behaviors. And we want to make sure that uh, seclusion is never used as a punishment or a way to control behavior, similar to restraint. And we want to make sure that we're not using seclusion for staff convenience, for dealing with difficult behavior, um, and that it's not being used as a threat to change student behavior. And again, similar to uh, restraint, seclusion shouldn't be used when it's contraindicated by a healthcare directive, behavior intervention plan, or IEP team. So knowing um, a student and that uh, the, the seclusion would have this negative impact, we want to make sure that um, we are following the healthcare directive um, and not using seclusion in that situation.
Again, similarly to restraint, seclusion must also be monitored. And we wanna make sure that if seclusion is being used, that an adult is always physically present and that they are able to monitor that student at all times and that that student is always visible. We wanna make sure that if a student is being secluded within a room or an area, that staff can always see that student. The monitoring needs to be in continuous and it need, we need to be making sure that students are not at risk of harming themselves, which is why we wanna make sure that students are visible at all times. And that if there is an injury, we wanna make sure that we are following our reporting guidelines and our local policy and that it should include ensuring, again, that staff are emotionally regulated. Similar to restraint, we wanna make sure that we're following all of the appropriate guidelines for maintaining that safety, and that's making sure that we are regulated. So we also wanna make sure that we talk about how we are ending seclusion. And similar to when we talked about ending restraints, chapter 33 gives us guidelines for how we are ending our seclusions. Seclusion has to end immediately when that risk of imminent danger of serious physical injury has passed. And we wanna make sure that if seclusion is continuing for more than 10 minutes, that we're determining on whether or not that seclusion continues to be warranted. Um, and we wanna make sure that that is safe. And so that, that monitoring is continuing. Similar to termination of restraint, um, if, those, the attempts to terminate uh, the seclusion haven't been successful. Staff can request uh, extra support from outside sources, uh, caregivers, parents, family, um, intervention teams, and um, you know any other community resources. So one of the differences between restraint and seclusion is that chapter 33 provides us some guidelines of where seclusion can actually take place. And the location of seclusion can take place in any part of the building or premises. We know that it's, seclusion can happen just within a defined area. However, if there is a specific room that is being identified to use for seclusion, it has to have adequate light, heat, ventilation, and has to be of a normal room height. So it also has to have 60 square feet, it has to have an unbreakable observation window, um, and it has to be free of hazardous material and objects with, a, with which a student can harm themselves. So if that room is being used specifically as a seclusion room, it needs to make, meet these very specific guidelines. So now we're gonna talk about what happens after the use of a restraint or seclusion. We're gonna talk about uh, what the notification process looks like, what an incident is, and how we're actually going to go through the documentation and then the debriefing of it as well. A good place to start with is what is the definition of an incident? When we're looking at restraint and seclusion, an incident includes all of the actions from the time a student behavior begins to create the risk of harm through to the time that the student ceases to pose a risk of harm and returns to the regular programming. So this definition in chapter 33 really isn't about just a restraint or just a seclusion. It's not about the time period that the restraint is being used. An incident includes all of the actions from the start uh, of the student's behavior creating that risk all the way through to the, the, the time when, uh, when that risk of harm is gone. So within an incident, we might see multiple uses of restraint or seclusion. Um, it might not just be one, within that whole range of time, we might see multiple uses. If within that time, there is a restraint or seclusion, then notification has to be followed. This is gonna include any uses of restraint or seclusion and unlawful restraint or seclusion. So we're making, reports, um, we were following that notification process, whether or not that the restraint or seclusion was appropriate or whether it was unlawful. Multiple uses of restraint seclusions might happen within one incident, and that's going to only prompt one notification. So if the incident is this time period from 
when there's sort of that risk of harm that's possibly be created all the way through to when that risk of harm has passed, we might see multiple restraints or seclusions happening, but that still counts as one incident and that is one notification. So we've been talking about the notification of that incident, right? Of that use of, of restraint or seclusion. When that happens, there needs to be a notification, but who actually gets notified? There are three important categories that we want to make sure have that notification. The first two, um, we want to make sure that a notification goes to the school administrator or to um, the designee, so the person that is has been assigned to receive that notification. The, the notification to those administrators ideally are as soon as possible, but certainly no later than the end of the school day. And if this is an out of district placement, we want to make sure that the school administration is notified within 24 hours or at least the next school day. We want parents to be notified as soon as practical, but no later than that same school day. We want to make sure that we are using as many different modes of notification as possible, leaving phone, leaving phone messages, making multiple calls, making sure to use emergency contact information to try to get that information to parents as soon as practical. If this occurs outside of the school day, we want to make sure that notification is as soon as possible and we're going to follow some of the emergency protocols that are set up. And written documentation must be provided to parents within seven, or seven calendar days of the incident. Now, the third area that we want to make sure that there's notification if, is if there is serious bodily injury or death. This is above that serious physical injury. Serious bodily injury is also defined in Chapter 33. Um, and we want to make sure that when harm rises to this extreme level, that there is notification um, as soon as possible and that we want to follow health and safety procedures that are outlined within our local school policies. We want to make sure that the administrators then also are notifying the Department of Education within 24 hours or the next school day. So with the notification also comes documentation and chapter 33 outlines what is required to be able to document an incident of restraint or seclusion. The incident report is going to include date, time, location. It's going to include whether the student has an IEP or a 504. There, um, there's a whole set of descriptors that are laid out within chapter 33 and the Department of Education provides a model um, of what that report can look like. It has to be completed and provided to the admin uh, for notification as soon as practical after the incident, but certainly within two school days of the incident. Parents need to be provided that report again within se seven calendar days of the incident. Debriefing is the process of what happens after an incident. So we want to make sure that there's an incident review. Chapter 33 outlines what is required for that. We want to make sure that review happens within two school days of the incident. And certainly no later than the next school day if that incident resulted in serious bodily injury. We want to review with the staff who implemented the restraint or seclusion. And we want to look at whether the use of restraint seclusion was in compliance with the rule and local policies. So like we said about the notification process and the documentation, we're documenting whether or not restraint or seclusion was permitted or whether it was unlawful. We want to make sure that we're reviewing how it was used. We want to look at preventing and reducing the future need for an emergency situation and then rising to the level of an emergency intervention with restraint or seclusion. And then we want to include that student in the review. Uh, we want to make sure that we talk about what was going on for the student and what led to that, them, that behavior and escalation. And then working together collaboratively between the student and staff so that we are preventing the future need for restraint and seclusion, knowing that it has that inherent risk of harm. After the debriefing, we want to make sure that staff are developing and implementing a plan for response, that we're looking at de-escalation strategies, and that we're reviewing plans uh, if we've already had ones that exist. We want to make sure that we're revising them to be most appropriate to fit with the situation that is currently happening for that student.
So if we have a student that is having multiple incidents of restraint or seclusion, now remember those are incidents, not multiple uses of, so we might have one incident where there's a number of restraint seclusions. But if we are having multiple incidents of restraint or seclusion, we wanna make sure that we are having reviews of their, of their intervention plans. So students who have IEPs or 504 plans, chapter 33 lays out that after every three incidences, the team needs to meet within 10 school days and that they're going to go over the incidents and consider looking at um, functional behavior assessments, behavior intervention plans, or to amend the ones that exist. For any other student that doesn't fall under that, so not having an IEP or 504, if a student is having after every three incidents of restraint or seclusion, the team is going to meet within 10 school days. That team might consist of a parent, an administrator, teacher, student, um, you know, having the appropriate staff involved so that the team can review and consider the appropriateness of a referral to special services or the need for an FBA or BIP or amending an existing plan. And this is caveated that while after every three incidences, the team needs to meet within 10 school days, Schools aren't required to hold more than one meeting within any 30 day school period. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, if multiple incidences are happening, that we're reviewing those incidences with the teams and that those teams are really coming up with the best intervention plans for that student, knowing that we're having this high rate of incidences and that we want to reduce using emergency interventions as a way of responding um, and that we're working on de-escalating and having resources for that student so that we're not ending up in an emergency situation. We discussed staff training both in restraint and in seclusion, and that we were looking for staff that have training by approved programs that are the ones that are implementing restraint and seclusion. We wanna make sure that there are a sufficient number of staff that have certification in these training programs so that if untrained staff have in, initiated a restraint or seclusion, that we have those trained staff available to be able to take over. Um, and that, that those staff that are uh, that have had that training, that a list of those staff are available so that everyone knows who they are and so that we can, uh, they can be contacted and brought in as needed. The approved programs list is maintained by the Department of Education and districts can choose to train staff from that program list. Um, all of the programs include core components in non-physical interventions, uh, positive alternatives, the ability to identify dangerous behaviors, so trying to get ahead of um, needing those interventions, simulated experience of actually administering restraint techniques, so actually being able to practice and simulate how to use restraint techniques correctly, reviewing the impacts of restraint and seclusion on a student, similar to some of the uh, impacts that we've gone over, but much more in depth. Uh, the realities of what it looks like and how restraint and seclusion is used with students, and then how staff and student debriefing can happen. So we've talked about the training and the approved programs and all of the different ways that we can use restraint and seclusion in schools. Ultimately, though, we really should be looking for the way to reduce the use of restraint and seclusion knowing that it should only be used in an emergency situation and that it has possible harms and negative impacts for both students and staff. So when we're thinking about what are some of the things that we can do just in our everyday practice to reduce restraint and seclusion, really thinking about things rising to that level of an emergency. If it's at an emergency situation, it's already too late, right? We wanna be looking for what are ways that we can intervene earlier, reduce some of those dysregulated responses, or even just be aware of them before the situation escalates to where it's already reaching an emergency space. We know that things that are most successful, they're not provided, it's not about a response to the behavior, but it's really looking at what are the overall supports that we're putting in place for this student? What is the culture and system of support that exists throughout the classroom and the school? What are the, um, what are the resources the student has? Who are the people that that student feels connected to? Knowing that those positive relationships with adults are part of resilience for kids. 
and really looking at how we're highlighting those pieces so that we're not focusing on the negative behavior that's the result of being dysregulated, but really about the situation that's leading to that dysregulation in the first place. So looking for that whole school approach, looking at culture, looking at using trauma-informed trainings for all staff, have it bringing in uh, bus drivers and our lunch staff and our, our frontline staff so that they're aware of the uh, the trainings and, and the needs for our students and that they feel included uh, in that, in the communication so that information is being passed to the correct people that can really help support students. Having those systems set up in place so that the all the classes uh, and all of the educators have that information and feel empowered to be able to support students rather than reacting once things uh, have riven, risen to an emergency level and really looking at building those relationships. We know that students do better when they feel like educators care about them. They have higher test scores and higher levels of engagement and att attendance, just having a positive relationship with the adults that are working with them. And part of that is moving away from punitive discipline and really looking at the benefits of restorative models where students are still held accountable and that rather than being removed and, and punished by being separated and being othered, actually being included in repairing and healing their community and being held accountable by people that they know care about them and that they care about. Just having that genuine connected relationship reduces dysregulated behavior and increases engagement. These are things that research has shown us over and over and over again, both in education and just in resilience for kids. And we know that we've had schools in Maine that have been able to reduce their use of restraint and seclusion by incorporating these ideas and by implementing best practice strategies. So in wrapping up this overview for the chapter 33 rule, I just wanna go through some of the significant takeaways from this training. And we know that the chapter 33 rule outlines how restraint and seclusion is used in schools and that it's in line with state law in, under the statute of 20A MRSA 4014. We know that there are risks and possible negative impacts from the use of restraint and seclusion, and that's why it is limited to being used only as an emergency intervention, and then only when there's imminent danger of serious physical injury. We wanna make sure that when we're using restraint and seclusion that it is meeting that threshold, and that it's restraint and seclusion is not being used as a way to punish or threaten, um, to reduce property damage or to control challenging behavior for students. Because of the possible risks of injury and those negative impacts, we want to make sure that restraint and seclusion is only being used as an emergency intervention. We know that this rule provides guidelines for documenting, reporting, debriefing, anytime that there were incidents of restraint and seclusion, and that those guidelines are specific and well-documented within the rule. And we also know that we can reduce the use of restraint and seclusion in schools through implementing trauma-informed best practice relational approaches um, and, and connecting with schools that have been doing this work. Your administrator is going to take some time to review your local policies uh, and procedures related to the Chapter 33 rule, and that will be the final step in this training. Finally, I would just like to say thank you for participating in this training, knowing that this is nearly an hour long and an overview of some pretty significant legal information um, and that the idea of restraint and seclusion can be intense. And we know that when we're talking about using these interventions in an emergency situation, that it's important to make sure that we're protecting kids, keeping them safe, and that's what chapter 33 is really seeking to do, is how are we using restraint and seclusion when appropriate in the right situation? And how are we working to reduce the need for using restraint and seclusion by implementing whole student approaches, relational approaches, and other best practice trauma-informed ways of working when supporting students. So thank you all. I hope you have a great school year. And from all of us at the MDOE, thank you for supporting Maine students and families and everyone in your community.
Thank you.